this day is called Good Friday. And we look back and we know that it's good because of what Christ has accomplished for us. But this is the darkest day of all eternity. I mean, we remember the darkest day of creation. And it causes us to worship. It starts in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I want to read you that passage. It's really short. It's not our passage for tonight. But this is where it starts. At least this is where we're going to start right here. This time. It says this in Luke chapter 22, verse 39. It says, And he came out and went... And as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew, and he went with, withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood, falling down to the ground. And when he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. It starts at that moment. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives. He's in the region that they call Olivet. And he's in a garden called Gethsemane. And that garden is where they would bring all the olives when it was at the time of harvest. Because Gethsemane means olive press. They would bring them there and they would press them and get the oil out of them. And here the, the son of glory is getting ready to go to the cross to be put to death and he is being pressed. And he starts to pray and he is in agony and he says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. See, Jesus isn't upset because he's about to go to the cross. It's not the wrath of God being poured out that's causing the agony. I mean, we would, we would expect that. I mean, if, if we were going to a punishment, we would be afraid of the punishment. But he has done nothing wrong. He is in agony because he knows that soon, that eternal unity with the Father that he has enjoyed from eternity past, all the way up into this time, will soon be severed. He knows that going to that cross, he is fulfilling the will of the Father to become sin. And in doing so, he will be cut off from the Father. It's a dark day. Never had that ever occurred. And he says, Father, if this cup can pass, take it. But nevertheless... Your will be done. He moves forward. From there, it's, it's a very quick process. He's betrayed by Judas. The mob comes and he's betrayed by Judas with a kiss. And he is handed over to the priests. And the priests take him for a trial. And it's a mock trial. It's, it's one that isn't even done right. But they, they have it so there's an appearance of being right. And so they, they try him and they, they abuse him and mock him and he is beaten in the trial and they accuse him of blasphemy. They say, that's it. He's, he's a blasphemer. He deserves to die. But they can't put him to death and so they take him to Pilate. They hand him over to Pilate 
because they're ruled by Rome and Rome has control and they're the only ones who can, can carry out a sentence of execution. And so the, the leaders bring Jesus to Pilate and they say, this man has been found guilty under our law and it's, it's a guilt that should bring him to death. Oh, and by the way, he calls himself a king, so he's even treasonous. He's against Rome. So here, Pilate, you have to bring this sentence about. Pilate questions Jesus, and as you read the accounts, the amazing thing is, is that Pilate can find nothing wrong. He's an innocent man. He, he questions him, and he's trying to release Jesus, and, and Pilate's stuck in this place where he wants to please the people and please the Jews, and, and at the same time, please his own conscience. He knows the man is innocent, that justice, if executed rightly means his release. He doesn't know what to do, and he finds out that Jesus is a Galilean, and he says, oh, I'll send him to Herod, and let Herod have to deal with it. So he goes, and, and he's, he's listened to again, and he says, I'm not going to do anything with this man. He mocks him, and they dress him in purple, and they mock him as a king, and they beat him, and they send him back to Pilate, and they say, nope, he's yours. You take care of him. And Pilate is stuck with Jesus again. And he doesn't know what to do. And he, so he brings Jesus out. He says, it's Passover. We have a custom. And that custom is, I show mercy. I release back to you. I pardon one of these people. Here we have Barabbas. And Barabbas was a rebel rouser. He was a murderer. He, in one of the Gospels, it says he was a robber. He was one who was trying to overthrow Rome with the zealots. Here is this man who's going to be executed. And he says, we have this guy, Barabbas. And he's thinking, as a murderer and a robber, there's no way they're going to want him over Jesus. And we have this Jesus. And they say, crucify him. We want Barabbas. Crucify this Jesus. Pilate's like, he's innocent. I know he's innocent, so I'll punish him. I'll, I'll have him flogged. He has him flogged. He brings him back out, and they say, crucify him. We want his blood. Pilate, he gives him over. Washes his hands, so to speak. But yet he's not guiltless because he is the one who could release Jesus. But yet he washes his hands and says, you want him, I'll give him to you. But yet he's still the authority of Rome. So he's still the one committing the, the sentence, having it done. And he hands him over to the soldiers to have him crucified. He's betrayed by Judas for greed. Judas wanted money. He wanted something more than the righteousness of God. There's something his heart longed for, and we have that in ourselves. There's, what are we greedy for? We are all greedy for something somewhere. We gladly would give Jesus over to satisfy our greed. He's sentenced by the religious leaders. Pilate says, actually, he understands why they bring Jesus because they're jealous of him. They're jealous of this Jesus. And we're jealous for our own control, for our own power, for our own position. We envy those around us. We would give over Jesus to keep power and control. Oh, we are so guilty. He's given over by Pilate, wanting to release him, but more wanting to satisfy men, to placate the crowd, to give them what they want. His choice is honor or ambition. It's principle or expediency. Our conscience too can be drowned out by the world's voices and we too can capitulate all too often because we like Pilate become cowards to walk in righteousness. You see we, we see it right at the beginning that we are just as guilty as those who we would say they're guilty of putting Jesus to death. It wasn't me. Oh no, we have the same heart. A same sinful heart.
Luke chapter 23, and you can follow with me. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country. And they laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For they do these things. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Here, Jesus is too weak to carry the cross. And so they pull this man out of the crowd, Simon, and they make him carry the beam that Jesus is too weak to carry. He is humiliated even further by having to carry the instrument of his death to the place of his death. And on the way, the women and those are weeping and they're, they're torn. They're seeing what has happened to this Jesus. And he says, with such great compassion, he says, don't weep for me. Don't weep for me. He's like, it's for you. It's for you you should have great concern. He's more interested in their repentance than he is in their sympathy. He says, it is for you you should be looking to, not to me. For a day is coming when justice will be handed out. And at that day, it will be fearful. He says, because if the Jews will hand me over, if Rome will do this to me, if these things will happen when it is green, how much worse will it be when the time is fulfilled? And he says, and it is dry. We see such great compassion in our Savior, even on his way to his death. Verses 32 to 34. There were two others who were criminals. They were led away to be put to death with him. And when he came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. You see, there were two criminals that were also being put to death that day. And so they take him to the place of the skull. Now, if you looked at pictures today, uh, Jerusalem has grown so much that actually the hillside where the place of the skull is, which is called Golgotha, there is or actually like an interstate that runs under it. But on the side, the rocks are formed in such a way that it looks as a skull. And it's outside of the city, and it's a hill. And so they would crucify, Rome would crucify those who were guilty on this hill. So you could look up, lifted up was Christ. And you would, they would look up and see those who were being crucified at this place of death. And these criminals were there to be put to death with him. And Jesus is placed in the middle. And in this moment, it says they crucified him. The soldiers lay him on the beam. They drive nails through his wrists and through his feet to keep him stationary. There would be a little stool that's also kind of put on the cross. So it, it keeps the prisoner from actually tearing away from the cross. Keeps him there. And then they drop the cross into, uh, a, a, there's a small hole. They just drop the cross down into it and they would fix it in there so it's stationary. And they would jar him as he is dropped. And what does he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This passage is not a, a them, meaning the Roman soldiers who are nailing him there. 
And it's them is not just the Jews. It is them universal. He is saying, Father, forgive them. Forgive you. Forgive me. Forgive mankind, for they don't understand what they're doing. The, the sin of man does not know what it is doing here. Don't hold this death against them, but hold this death in their place, those who would come for faith. And he says, they do not know what they do. It says here, they cast lots to divide his garments. Oh, think back with me. Back in the garden, Adam was naked and unashamed, and then sin and death comes into the world, and what does he do? He covers himself, and he hides, and he's clothed, and he's, he's trying to hide from God. And he feels guilt, and Christ is stripped naked and put on the cross, and he is guiltless. He has no guilt. He is innocent. And he takes on the guilt of man. And he is stripped bare, laid for all to see. In Genesis, the blood of Abel cried out for justice. At the cross, the blood of Jesus brings satisfaction. Brings the justice that is called for. So he says, Father, forgive him. They do not know what they do. Verse 35 to 39. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, if he is the Messiah of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. He had been beaten. He had been mocked. He was innocent. He's being crucified between two who are guilty. And the soldiers even here, if you were a king, command your people. Oh, let's get wine for the king and it's sour vinegar and this sponge to help ease the suffering of those who are being crucified. And they're, and they're bringing that up and not just offering it to him, but they're mocking him. They're like, here's your wine, your majesty. If you're the king... Command your people, have them save you, bring yourself down. And the, and the religious leaders are saying, if you're the Christ, save yourself. You've saved others. Save yourself. And then even the one who is guilty and is going to die, even this criminal who's guilty says to him, are you not the Christ? Then prove it. Save yourself and us. Get us off the cross. Come on. Mocks him. Taking guilt and shame and ridicule. He's dying. Verse 40 to 43. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Do you not fear God? Do you not fear God? We are dying, but justly. We deserve the death. This man does not. And seeing this, the, the criminal being crucified there, seeing this and listening to the mockery and listening to what they're saying about this Messiah comes to the realization he is who they say he is. And they're killing him. And he has no guilt 
But yet we justly are being put to death. And he knows that in a moment, his life is going to be over. And he will stand before holy, holy, holy God. And Jesus' life will be over. And he says, I have no right to stand before holy, holy, holy God and claim anything. To have any justification. Because I'm getting what I deserve. And I deserve so much more. But this man deserves nothing. And he turns to him and says, Jesus... When you enter your kingdom, will you remember me? My only hope is in the one who is innocent. My only hope is in this man to to speak for me before holy God. That Jesus would, would be my advocate. Here's my faith. Jesus, I'm about to die. And so when we stand before holy, holy God, before the Father, and justice will be sentenced, will you remember me? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, paradise. Paradise. Jesus spoke of hell many times when he walked the earth. And hell was a place that had eternal consequence. See, hell is the separation from God. And God made man with an eternal soul. Man is eternal and hell is eternal. And God is eternal. Why is this situation so important? He says paradise is that place in the parable he talked about where when man died, the rich man went to Sheol. He went to hell to be tormented. And while he was there, he looks up and he looks into the bosom of Abraham. He looks into paradise. And he sees Lazarus with the rich man. And he says, can he help me? Can he quench my tongue? I'm in agony. And Abraham says, we cannot. There is a chasm here. We cannot cross it. You had opportunity in this life. And this man had a hard life. He had suffering. And yet, now the reward comes and he is comforted for all eternity here. But you, you have your reward which is condemnation. You see, because our rebellion is against an eternal, holy, holy, holy God, the punishment must fit. We are eternal beings. And our punishment against an eternal God means that we have a punishment, a wrath that is poured out and it is carried out. The sentence is eternity. And Jesus says to this thief, today you will be with me. You will be comforted. His faith, his trust has been shifted to Jesus. And Jesus is dying for this thief in this moment. He says, today, when it's all over, you will be with me. There's nothing this man can do except fall on the grace and mercy of Christ there at the cross. There's no good works to be done. There's nothing other than trusting in what Jesus is doing. And Jesus says, you will be with me this day in paradise. You see, we all like sheep have gone astray. We've all gone to our own way. In the eyes of every man is his own way that seems right, but the end is death. And here, Jesus says, for the one who trusts, this thief who trusts, is paradise. Verse 44 and following. It was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. This moment in the Old Testament, darkness is is a sign of judgment. And in this moment, it's daytime. It's the middle of the afternoon. And darkness comes and, and blocks out the sun. And the judgment of God is happening. And what Jesus was afraid of in the Garden of Gethsemane, what caused him to start sweating blood, this is when he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the moment where he who knew no sin has become sin and the wrath of God is being poured out. And his relationship with the Father is severed. It is in this moment 
that the agony is great. This is what makes it so dark. That the king of glory willingly goes to the cross and is put to death and he willingly has his relationship with the father severed for us. For sinners. That he takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. In the Gospel of John, he cries out, it is finished. And if you remember with me, back to the beginning of John that we had been studying, we talked about the bridegroom coming for his bride, and he had to meet with the the elders at the gate, and he would have to provide a, a payment, a dowry for that bride. And in this situation, to redeem the church, to redeem the bride that Jesus wants, he is saying that it takes my very life to do so, to make her clean and pure, to sanctify her and make her able to come into the presence of God, into our presence. I have to give my very life for her and spill my blood for her to be the sacrifice for her. Because she cannot do this. And this is the payment that must be paid if I am to receive my bride, the church. And Jesus on the cross says, it is finished. Saying, I have paid all that is required. I have done it. And now the bride can be received. She can be mine. She can now be washed white and pure. And she can be holy in our sight. Because she is now given my righteousness. I have provided for her. It is finished. And Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathes his last. He is dead. Verse 47. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. The other gospels Give us a a fuller picture. The the darkness came and the veil is torn in two. Meaning that now man has access to God. And we now can come because of the blood of Jesus. We now can come to God. We can be reconciled. We can be counted as sinless and guiltless. And we can come to God. And there was a great earthquake. And the centurions are there. And they're watching this all happen. They've killed so many people that they know the difference between those who are guilty and innocent. He can look and look at Jesus and know how he suffers and know if this man truly was innocent or not. And he sees it and he beholds the earthquake and he beholds the darkness and all that has happened and they are are very much afraid. And he says, truly, this man was innocent. Truly, he was the son of God. Truly, he was the king of the Jews. I mocked the king, and he was the innocent one, and he truly was Messiah. And he has this moment of clarity. And those who saw it, they go away, and they're beating their breast. The guilt of it sits on them. The ones who were there crying, crucify, crucify now see Jesus crucified and dead, and they were, we were so wrong. What have we done? What have we done? We have crucified this man who was sinless, who was without guilt. We have murdered him. His blood is on us. Where is hope to be found now? The one that was hailed as Savior, as Messiah, We have killed him. Where is hope to be found? Because we put him to death. So they leave in anguish, beating their breasts. 50 to the end of the chapter. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. 
And he was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. Well, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day they rested according to the commandment. Joseph comes. He's part of the council. We also read in the other gospel that Nicodemus comes, who also was part of the council. And these two men said, no, he's, he's not worthy of death. He's not a blasphemer. He's not guilty. He's bringing the kingdom of God to us. And they looked for Jesus to bring the kingdom of God. After his death, Joseph goes to Pilate. He asks for the body. And because it is the day of preparation, there's no time to do all that is needed or required to give a proper burial. But he can bury him in his own grave. And so he wraps him in a linen shroud and he puts him in there and they seal the tomb. And the women go and they see what is, where he is laid and they return. This is a dark day, but it's a good day because the will of the Father was to redeem sinful man. And the blood that was shed was was that innocent Lamb of God who was slain for, for us so that we could be set free from sin and death and our relationship to God restored. What was accomplished in that moment of darkness at the earthquake when the Son of God died? What was accomplished? God's law was satisfied. That justice was rightly given. And this is a marvelous thing to behold. That eternal God, who gives his wrath that is without measure for those who perish without Jesus will have the wrath poured out on them for eternity in a place called hell. His eternal wrath poured out on the Son of God on that cross is absorbed completely. I can't fathom how that works. But but the one who can do it is Jesus. The innocent one can take the eternal wrath and absorb it completely. It is done. It is finished. And the righteousness that he brings is given to us who believe. And the justice that is required is honored. It is fulfilled. Justice is served at the cross. The law is fulfilled. And God shows himself to be a God who loves. Not only is he a God of justice and wrath, but he is a God of mercy and love. And he pours out this wrath on his son who loved us, who gave himself for us. God is satisfied. Love is satisfied. What happens there? The Old Testament points to the one that needs to bear sin. There is the sacrifices of the lamb that needed to bear sin. In the New Testament, man is to die, but Christ, the lamb of God, is the substitute, and he bears the sin. What is given? Our redemption, our justification, our reconciliation, our propitiation. All of these things are given to us there at the cross. Freely, grace and mercy meet. I want to give you the timeline because I know historically we we celebrate today, Good Friday, as the day Jesus was crucified. But I believe the scriptures speak pretty clearly this is a high Sabbath. This is a holy day because at the end of Passover is immediately a Sabbath. It doesn't matter what day of the week it falls on. It is a Sabbath because it is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's the next holiday and the Sabbath and Unleavened Bread fall back to back. And so on the 10th of Nisan, you have Jesus Sunday, the triumphal entry, the 10th of Nisan, the Lamb of God comes in and all the Jews are to get a lamb for the Passover. 
And the Lamb of God comes into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. And on that Monday and Tuesday, the 11th and 12th, he is there in Jerusalem teaching and preaching and, and, and preparing. And on the 13th into the 14th, the 13th, he is crucified. That is Wednesday. That is the day of preparation. 13th evening into the 14th. That is a high Sabbath. That is a Thursday. The Jews all must celebrate that. It's a, it's a high Sabbath, the day of preparation. They say, we've got to get Jesus off the cross because it's the day of preparation. We're all getting ready for the next feast. So he must be brought down. And so the women go. There's no time to do anything. They go, they see where he's laid, and they retreat. They can't do anything. They take the 14th, that high Sabbath, off. They, they prepare to go, and Friday they go to buy all the spices and everything they need, and it takes them. They don't have all that we have today. They can't just make everything so quickly. It takes the good part of a day to prepare all the spices for a burial, all that they need to do for him. And so most of Friday they prepare and they get ready to go, but Saturday's a Sabbath. That's the regular weekly Sabbaths, and so they cannot go. At this point, Jesus has been in the grave for three days and three nights. What did he say in the scriptures? He says, the sign I give you, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. God fulfills the Sabbath in Jesus on the way it was supposed to be fulfilled and he is shown to be holy and true and right and he does this and he brings to us salvation through Jesus. And so that Sunday when the women go at the first of the week when they go, he is resurrected. And so this day we think of all that has happened for us. We all like sheep have gone astray. And Jesus bore our guilt at the cross. Let's pray. Thank you for listening. To find out more about the Bridge Bible Church or listen to previous podcasts, please visit thebridgewire.com.